The door is locked. And the gaps are plugged with towels. But I don't think it'll make any difference. I hear my neighbors driving by outside the barricaded window, completely unaware of the horrors taking place inside this house. I guess I just want someone else to know the truth. It started as these things often do, with something completely unexpected. An event that came screeching in out of the dark to smash the quiet life that I'd built for my wife, Alice, and our son, Jake. We tried so hard to childproof our house. We protected the power outlets, used baby gates, and stored dangerous chemicals far out of reach. I don't know where Jake got a hold of that small glass bead. I mean, maybe he found it outside, in the street, or at the playground. All I know is, the moment he swallowed it, that little ball of glass cut off his air supply completely. Alice and I tried desperately to remember the Heimlich maneuver and perform it on our squirming, crying, purple-faced child. But we only made things worse. By the time the EMT arrived, Jake had stopped breathing. He lay in my wife's arms, limp and lifeless as a ragdoll, drool dribbling out of his bluish lips. The looks on the paramedics' faces when they finally arrived told us everything we needed to know. Despite their best resuscitation efforts, our son was gone. I still remember the way that my wife's hot tears soaked through my shirt as we walked out to the ambulance with Jake. I just wanted to hold his tiny hand until the last minute, until they loaded him into that sterile metal box and the doors closed on him forever. Then, suddenly, Jake grabbed my finger. His eyes snapped open, and with a pop, the cat's eyes beat popped out of his mouth. The paramedics couldn't believe it. The resuscitation efforts had ended eight minutes ago, and Jake, Jake had been legally dead for almost half an hour. Lazarus Syndrome, they called it. <laughs> but, I mean, I didn't care about names or diagnoses. I didn't care about tests and trials, clinical statistics. I was just happy to have my son back. And Jake was quieter than I remembered before. His, his big blue eyes had sparked like sunlight on the sea. But now, now, however, they seemed darker, deeper somehow like like I was looking into a still bottomless pool I found that I couldn't maintain eye contact with him for long maybe that was the first sign maybe that's when I should have acted but it's too late now and like most new parents Alice and I had been terrified to leave Jake's side at first we kept his crib in our bedroom but I mean, after his recovery, we found we couldn't sleep with Jake nearby. He would, he would stand and stare at us all night, his hands grabbing the bars of his crib like a death row inmate in teddy bear pajamas. Although Alice and I never talked about it, we could, we could both feel his gaze probing at the back of our skulls, as though he was trying to drill them open and let something in. A few weeks later, we moved Jake's crib into my office. That's why we were so terrified to find him in bed with us at 3 a.m. the next night. He lay, sucking his thumb with one hand, and had the other on Alice's hip in a way that seemed strangely adult and possessive. Worse still, when I looked at that hand out of the corner of my eye, it didn't seem like a toddler's arm at all. It looked stretched, hairy, and horrible. When I carried my sleeping son back to his crib, I wondered if I was having some kind of psychological reaction to the trauma of Jake's death and unexpected resuscitation. Hey, that could have been the only explanation for the things that I was seeing and feeling. Right? As I put Jake back in his crib, I noticed something red on his lip. With awful adult intelligence, he quickly tried to hide it from me, but I spun him back around. 
Jake opened his mouth wide. A waterfall of blood poured out. I'd never, I'd never seen so much in my life. I screamed for Alice and looked around for something, anything, to stop the bleeding. Behind me, I could hear the gory stream spattering on the floor. That wasn't all. When I turned again, hundreds of round cat's eye beads were dribbling from my son's mouth. What? Alice burst into the room with a shout. I pointed to Jake. But, but he was fine. Our son sat sleepily in his crib with a puzzled expression on his face as though he was concerned about my weird behavior. I tried to stammer an explanation to Alice on our walk back to bed, but I couldn't shake the feeling that my son was laughing silently at me behind my back. From there, things only got worse. The next night, I woke from a revolting dream in which a giant leech was writhing around inside of my sheet, sucking me dry. And just like in the dream, there was a, a weight on my chest when I woke. It was Jake, giggling as he crawled around our bed. It was all I could do to keep myself from shoving him off of me. This is your son, I told myself. You love him. And it was true. But more and more, I was starting to wonder whether the thing inside the crib was really Jake at all. I installed a bolt on Jake's bedroom door. Surely that would stop his late night wanderings. But the next night, my son was back in bed with us again. I placed a motion-activated camera in the hallway, hoping to figure out how on earth Jake had opened the bolt. And what I saw in that eerie night vision footage... It will haunt me for the rest of my life. Something slid beneath my son's door, a hand. At first it looked like Jake's, but as the arm stretched upwards towards the lock and the fingers extended, it, its appearance changed into something monstrous. My son's arm had somehow passed beneath the door, reached all the way up its length, and unbolted its lock with clawed, hairy fingers. The hideous arm retracted, the door creaked open, and Jake... Jake crawled along the ceiling towards our bedroom. The last still image the camera captured was Jake's freakishly extended foot and snarling face as he kicked it away. I watched the clip again and again, unable to reconcile what I'd seen with the toddler dozing peacefully just a few feet away. During the day, Jake was completely normal. He threw tantrums, colored, played with his toys, asked a few questions every five seconds. He fell asleep, eating his Cheerios. Maybe, maybe it was just at night when he, when he would, a sudden thump jolted me out of my reverie. Jake was awake. In fact, he was standing right next to me, a, a lifeless expression on his face. He just slammed his little fist onto my computer right above the port where I'd inserted the camera's SD card. Was, was he trying to destroy the video? Thump! Jake brought his fist down two more times with impossible strength, shattering my laptop's fragile plastic covering and the SD card inside, and, and that wasn't all. My mind didn't want to process it, I couldn't process it, but Jake, Jake had grown taller than me. I looked down in horror at the extra 40 inches of deformed flesh that started at my son's pajama bottoms and extended in the clawed feet on the floor. I shut my eyes and clamped down a scream, and when I opened them again, Jake was crawling around the rug, completely fixated on the toy truck in front of him. His face and body were completely normal. But my laptop, my laptop was a broken mess. Jake, or whatever was inside of him, was, it was getting more powerful. 
Alice and I felt hunted inside our own home. Whenever we tried to discuss what was happening to Jake, we'd hear his tiny feet scurrying impossibly fast, and suddenly he'd be standing right beside us, listening, watching with those dark blue, endlessly deep eyes. After what happened last night, I suppose I can't blame Alice. I can't, I can't blame Alice for leaving. I, I'd spent the day installing a key-operated lock on Jake's bedroom door. I set up a baby camera in the room that streamed live to Alice and I. It, in case he needs us, I told myself. But the truth was, I'd set it up for our own protection. If Jake started... It, it, if he started to change... We'd know about it. The new setup was supposed to help us sleep, but in the end, Alice and I just lay awake, watching what was happening on the other side of the baby camera. We stared at our perfectly normal, snoring, thumb-sucking toddlers, though we were watching a tense scene in a horror movie, the kind so terrifying that it's impossible to look away. We'd gone without sleep for so long, I, I suppose it was only a matter of time. I couldn't blame Alice when she dozed off on my shoulder. I kept nodding off as well. I tried to tell myself that one of us needed to keep watching. But every time I looked up, the scene on the screen was unchanged. The small, cute shape of Jake in his onesie pajamas, one arm around his teddy bear. Maybe things are fine now. The treacherous, exhausted part of my mind whispered to me, maybe, maybe the danger, or whatever it was, maybe it's past. My chin hit my chest. My eyes popped open with a start. A dark shape, probably Jake's teddy bear, lay in front of the camera, blocking it. And where was our son? Mm -hmm. At first, I didn't notice the sound coming from beside me. I turned slowly, almost not wanting to see, and saw Jake's monstrous fingers toying with my wife's hair. His open mouth pressed against hers, and something bulky and hideous was sliding down her throat. Although whether Jake was draining something out of Alice or infesting her with something of his own, I couldn't tell. My whole world became that horrible, strangled sound, those two entangled fingers lit only by the eerie green glow of the screen, and my own paralyzing fear, Alice's hand struggling feebly, trying to pry Jake off of her face. It was only then that I found the strength to act. I grabbed Jake from behind and pulled. It took both of our combined strength to pry him, screeching and flailing off Alice's face, both of their mouths still covered with a lipstick smear coated of bright red blood. Alice coughed and spit something up. A tiger's eye glass bead. She stared at it for a long second, and then... And then... She grabbed her purse. And she walked out the door. I could hear Jake giggling beside me as Alice started her car in the misty 4 a.m. darkness. Even then, I knew in my heart I'd... I'd never see her again. I've been home alone with Jake since then. He's been testing the boundaries, changing more often and more obviously. I think he knows that no help is coming for me. I could hear him running through the house, laughing, smashing things for fun. It's only a matter of time now. I'm not afraid of death. The moment Alice left, I accepted my fate. No, see, what I'm afraid of is, what if death isn't the end? What if, after whatever Jake does to me, I just, I just wake up again and spit a tiger's eye ball of glass out onto the floor? What if I wake up as something else? Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I want to tell you thanks so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. Quick reminder, I am also a narrator over at Chilling. 
If you guys like the stories that you're listening to here, then I'm sure you'll like the stories that you can listen to over at Chilling, because they're almost the same thing, I'm still narrating them, but you can select your own background music or background sounds, and you could select a whole mess of other narrators, such as Autumn Ivy, Swamp Dweller, and a bunch of my other friends. If you guys are interested in checking out Chilling App, starting up with a free trial, you can use the link in the description down below, or you can head over to thechillingapp.com and also use those free trials to win prizes from their giveaways. And as always, I would love to give a big thank you to everyone who is supporting me over on Patreon. You guys are the real MVPs, you guys keep things going, especially while things have been nuts for me over the past couple of months, and things have been getting crazier and crazier as time goes on. You guys are the ones who are keeping me sane, and I mean that with all sincerity, that you guys have helped me immensely. So, in my personal life and my professional life, I want to give a very big thank you to... Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fenske, Jeff Burnett, Diana Krause, Lakeda Canizales, Mr. B. Foster, Pettis Pleaser, Gattis, Joseph Calarudo, Would It Be, Dante Kincaid, Boxhound 803, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Priorch, Bastion Beefcake, Jeff the Killer's Cultist, Love You Eminem, M, Insanity Gamer X, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Amber Cork, Jay Kearns, Himbo Jerry, Sam Ahai, Crusader Chocobo, Adam Arias, Captain Scurvy, Escadine, Raiden Morris, Nate Cull, Our Min Sec Time, Angelus, Seclude, That Creepy Chick, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier and Cheyenne, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Cryolinium, Lord Life's Best, Goran Trimagazine, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Michael Limchok, Dirk Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sam, Chelly J, Michael Mel, Deleted Account, Melted Lake, Polly Sue, William King, Sashi Sasaku, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Peter Chip, Acid System, Mom. Kiri the Sloth, Fester's Lampshade, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, and Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, and Cory Kenshin. To everyone on this list, everyone in the description, and of course anyone who could support even just one dollar, thank you all so much for making my life significantly easier with this. And if you guys would like to be able to join any of the names that you see here, or down there, or anything at all, head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. And with that, I wish you all a very, very pleasant night, and sweet dreams.